You just tuned into the world's number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast on YouTube. This is Mind Pump. You're going to love today's episode. I interviewed John Romano. This guy's an icon in the muscle building world. He's been writing articles about the all things muscle building, including the dark side, for years. In fact, I grew up reading this guy's stuff. I love talking to him because he's super honest. So if you want to know all the stuff that you probably can't learn from traditional websites, the stuff that you can only learn from talking about people who know all the secrets, including how to use anabolic steroids and all that stuff, you're going to love this episode. By the way, John has a great podcast called Fitness, Fame, and Fortune. If you like honest, no-holds-barred conversation, if you like John, go check out his podcast. It's freaking awesome. Oh, and by the way, leave a comment uh, underneath this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this podcast. And if we pick your comment, if we like your comment, we'll send you a free t-shirt right to your door. And this shirt is incredible. I'm not going to lie. It does make you stronger and sexier instantly. Instantly. Put it on. Boom. Stronger and sexier. So if you want a shirt, leave a comment. Also, turn on your notifications and subscribe to this channel. One more thing before we get going. We are running a promotion on two workout programs and a bundle. Here they are. They're all 50% off. We have MAPS HIT. That's high intensity interval training. We have MAPS SPLIT. That's a bodybuilder split workout program. And then we have the bikini bundle. That's multiple workout programs combined and put together. All of them 50% off. Go check them out. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code SPRINGBREAK for 50% off. All right. Enjoy this controversial but fun podcast. John, good to see you again, my friend. Good to see you too. You, you, you Looking know, very comfortable there. Oh, oh, thank you. My nice big chair. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, this is always weird for me because, uh, and I we had you on Mind Pump a while ago. I, I think this is before, it's like an episode 900 something. So it's, since then we've done, I don't know, 600 episodes or so. And uh, <laughs> this is always weird because uh, I, you're, I, I grew up reading all your stuff. You were, uh, you know, when I was reading everything I could about building muscle, burning body fat, bodybuilding, and especially when I was reading about all the stuff that, you know, you're not supposed to talk about or whatever, uh, you were the guy, you know, you were the guy. So it's, it's really cool to be able to talk to you like this and have you on my show. So it's, it's kind of surreal. Um, but we do have a, a, a a larger audience since the last time I had you on, probably a lot of new listeners. Um, I'd love for you to give a little bit of background to start. Um, you are a what I consider a guru in in bodybuilding, but in particular, you're known for knowing uh, all the all the information about um, performance enhancing drugs, steroids, how athletes use them, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So uh, how did you learn all this? How did you get into this, uh, the space? Well, I, I wouldn't say I have all the information, but um, yeah. I, I have enough. Let's put it that way. Um, how did I get into it? I, you know, I was, I happened to be at the right place at the right time. You know, um, I happened to be in prison with a guy named Dan Duchesne and it all kind of <laughs> started from there. So, um, I, you know, that was, 1987, eight, nine, something around there. And, um, you know, I, I just got interested in the problem solving aspect of performance enhancement. And he was the guru, the original guru, and pre pretty much discovered, I would say, 90% or more of what bodybuilders and, and strength athletes, even track athletes, and to some degree, Olympic athletes use to this day to enhance their performance. So uh, so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, it's pretty well known that athletes at high levels use performance enhancing drugs, which can include uh, everything from testosterone, steroids, growth hormones, mm -hmm. and then all, it, there's a lot more than that as well. When did athletes really start experimenting with uh, with these substances? Probably in the 1930s. I, I think the 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 Olympic athletes were were availed to what the Western Europeans, or I mean the Eastern European bloc nations, were doing, and and they were you know typically. I, I, I don't think it can, it's fair to call it cheating at the time because really 
you know, there, I guess, you know, there's, there's, there's been sort of a set of rules that limit your ability to enhance performance. And since the beginning of time immemorial that those rules have been promulgated, there has been a faction of athletes and coaches hell bent on beating them. So, um, you know, it, it just, it just poses interesting propositions and, and, you know, uh, as as you go along with you know trying to 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 beat drug tests to cheat to whatever um you know technology just increases and it gets better and better yeah i i, I recall the uh, was it the east german um female swim team was i think that was probably when people started to really pay attention you know they all come out of the locker room um looking like you know like like me <laughs> and they blew everybody out, uh, you know, of the water. Essentially, was that when people started to really pay attention? Like, what's going on? It was. It was the East German swimmers. Uh, you know, they, they had a they had a, a pretty noticeable masculinizing effect to them. Um, to, to be kind, um, it, you know, the, the Russians, the Bulgarians, they were they were all they were all you know, doing it. And with, with women, with men, it, it just didn't matter. It was their, their mindset was win. Um, however you do that, you just win. So it didn't matter it, whether women were giving up their femininity. It didn't matter if men were having heart attack. That, none of that mattered to Eastern countries. What mattered is gold medals, winning prestige, you know, the, the, the bragging rights of, of winning. When would you say it started to get uh, more uh, popular in America with our professional athletes? I would assume the probably started in the Olympics and then you'd start seeing it maybe in football, I would assume. Is that, is that where you'd say the first kind of widespread use of, of anabolic started happening? Well, there, there, was, there, there were several disciplines sort of vying at the same time. There was cycling, there was Olympic lifting, there was bodybuilding, and there was track and field. And, and all of those disciplines were u utilizing their own brands of performance enhancement that sort of all culminated into them discovering that, wow, hormones are the way to go. So um, that, that I, football players were taking Diana Ball, um, cyclists were experimenting with EPO and, and, and other stimulants. Uh, I, and in fact, there's a, there's a spot on the on the Tour de France route that commemorates the spot where a famous cyclist I forgot his name French guy died uh, during the course of the race of of uh, amphetamine overdose so um, track and field were using amphetamines testosterone uh, drugs like Winstrol that were supposed to you know keep you lean and and, and tight and fast and whatever. Um, I, I think Ben Johnson failed his drug test for the nozzle wall. So, um, you know, there, there was kind of all going at the same time. Then you had some notables pop out. You know, you had, you had, you know, in the late eighties, you had, you know, you had Lyle Alzado and you had Ben Johnson and you had, uh, football players, uh, you know, parent groups of, of worrying about their football player sons taking Diana ball. So it was kind of like a cauldron all brewing at the same time. I don't think you can actually pinpoint it to one specific element. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned a few different, uh, steroids. You said, you know, Winstrol, and then you mentioned testosterone. What's the difference between testosterone and the other anabolic steroids? Now, testosterone is considered a steroid hormone. Steroid refers to the, just the chemical structure. I mean, technically cholesterol is a steroid. Um, but what's the difference between testosterone and, uh, other steroids? Why make other steroids? I, I, I think the first thing you got to do is understand the difference between androgens, what we call androgens, and what we call anabolics. So what's termed an androgen is typically, obviously, something of a high androgenic value with testosterone um, being the baseline. So um, the drugs that were more uh, androgen were as or more androgenic than testosterone, but less anabolic were termed androgens and drugs that were more anabolic and less androgenic were termed steroids. The difference being for most, not all, most steroids, 
steroids are an, an, a, a uh, amount, not an amalgam, a, a, a structural change on the molecular level to testosterone. So you start with testosterone, you augment the, 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 the structural formation of the molecule, and you have a new drug. And the, the, a drug that could be either more anabolic and less androgenic than testosterone or less androgenic and, or, or more androgenic and less anabolic, depending on what you're looking for. You know, strength athletes, you know, power lifters, they want more androgens. Stre- speed and strength athletes, speed and, and in, endurance athletes want less bulk, more density, you know, a higher endurance threshold. So it just matters what, you know, sport you're pursuing is going to dictate what cycle of drugs you're going to use. Okay. So what's the, what are the main differences then between anabolic and androgenic? And my, for my knowledge, anabolic is building muscle, right? Pro, I guess, uh, protein synthesis. Androgenic is everything that turns you into a man, you know, my voice lowering, growing facial hair, that kind of stuff. Uh, am, am I, am I hitting the nail on the head? And if that's the case, why would you want one over the other? What are the benefits of an androgenic steroid versus one that's more anabolic the the more androgenic the drug is the more androgenic effect you're going to have and which includes the secondary sexual characteristics of a male you know the deep voice the hair the, the lower body fat all of the increased muscle mass all of those things that differentiate men from women um the problem with androgens is that they come with significant side effects, most of which are undesirable for uh, bodybuilding and, you know, other drugs too, and women. So um, you, you want, you want to mitigate the, the, the bad the side effects, which would be acne, wild hair growth, uh, aggression, um, water weight gain, uh, you know, all kinds of, you know, things of, of that nature. Whereas anabolics tend to have less of the androgenic effect and are just typically more anabolic. They're not as anabolic as the androgen, but they are nevertheless anabolic with less side effects. So what typically you would do is you would pick an androgen, typically testosterone, and you'd stack a steroid or two on top of it. So you have the base androgenic effect, which you want, but you also mitigate the undesirable effects by adding the the steroid. So you're getting a greater anabolic effect, the sum total of the mixture is going to give you a greater anabolic effect and a net lower androgenic side effect, which is less undesirable side effects. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, being somebody who's experimented with them yourself and then having worked with so many athletes, what does it feel like to be on a highly anabolic, low androgenic steroid versus one that's very androgenic and, and low anabolic? What, would, what is the difference in feel? It, it, it's psychological is the, is, is the feel because a high androgen dose, you've heard the term roid rage, um, you know, uh, it, it, that's, there's a, and it, it, also, it also depends on how susceptible you are to it. I know guys that can take a, a gram and a half of test a week and they're as docile as puppies. I know guys who can take a, who can walk by a drugstore that sells testosterone and they're dragging people out of their cars and beating them up. So it, it just depends on what your propensity towards unbridled aggression is. If you are susceptible to aggression, testosterone is definitely going to bring it out of you. Um, you know, so that is the, probably the biggest feel. And if you can channel that aggression in the gym, you will find yourself putting up some pretty impressive personal records. Um, as far as anabolics go, what that feels like, the feel of that is more, you, you look in the mirror and you just see yourself getting denser and harder and veinier and leaner. And, and it's just, it's kind of like a, a self um, a self-progressing, you know, kind of thing that you see, you see yourself improving. So you work harder and it, that's the kind of psychological aspect of that. They're very different. Okay. So that makes sense. I could see how some people would like the feel of an androgen, a strong androgen, because that aggressive feeling, I mean, I like that when I work out. Um, and then the anabolic, of course, the aesthetics, uh, you know, that go along with it. What are some of your favorite, um, steroids that are high in highly androgenic would it just be testosterone is that your favorite on that list well yeah testosterone is 
by far the best, most useful baseline drug to consider when you're talking about using performance enhancing drugs, mainly because it's the, it's the testosterone in the bottle is no different structurally from the testosterone your body produces. So, uh, you know, the source of it's different, but the struct, the chemical is the same. So your body's used to dealing with that. You add more of it. It's just your body's used to dealing with it versus, you know, other things on top of that that are completely foreign to your body. So I always would suggest that the baseline component to a stack is testosterone. And you go up on top of that, depending on what you want. So if it, it, what, what's your goal? Your goal is going to determine, you know, what else you're going to do. That's not to say that all steroid stacks start with testosterone. They don't. There's completely legitimate, what we call aesthetic stacks that have, you know, the things like um, equipoise and DECA. You know, that's, that's for a very mild, you know, non-problematic. You can do low dose, get a lot of gain out of it, um, but you're not going to be Jay Cutler. So um, th- 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 that, that leads us into a whole other aspect of misconceptions is that, is that the giant bodybuilder, if you do his drugs, you're going to look like him. And, and that's completely not the case. Although a lot of people consider that formula when they're deciding what they want to do. And it's just nuts. Mm. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, you know, obviously being in the space, as long as I have, I've heard, uh, and done my own reading on certain oh. compounds. Uh, I remember people referring to a steroid like Anadrol as uh, gorilla steroids. Like you take this and you just gain a pound a day or whatever. I mean, is that true? And if it is, how's it working? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Anadrol is a great drug, you know, it has its purpose. Uh, it can also be a terrible drug. It just depends on how you use it, for how long you use it, how old you are when you use it. They all play a role in you know, what you're going to get out of it. Um, it it's just, uh, I'm sorry, I lost your... Yeah, oh, the, qu- the question is, uh, I remember hearing about it as being this one you take and you just gain oh, yeah. weight. Oh. Yeah, like crazy. Yeah, well, I mean, if if, if you do, you got to differentiate what, what the weight is. I mean, it's, it's mostly water. It's not going to be muscle. You're not going to gain a pound of muscle a day taking a drug. You're not. I don't care what anybody tells you or what you read on the internet. It's not going to happen. So uh, water is probably the predominant factor in, in anadrol weight gain. Okay. Now, um, when people – I heard you mentioning, you know, taking a gram and a half or you're mentioning numbers or whatever – what would be like a typical starter stack for somebody? Let's say it's a guy, he wants to gain muscle, um, isn't trying to go crazy, but wants to see you know, a certain amount of, uh, of results from, from doing this. What are, the, what are people starting with? They're starting, they're starting with the wrong impression is what they're starting with. Okay. And, and, and I think you have to address that first because if you made a pie chart out of, everything that you're going to do to enhance performance and you're going to slice that pie up into percentage portions of what plays the biggest role in anabolism uh, and performance enhancement, you'll find that this pie cut for drugs is probably 15 or 20% of the pie. It's not that big. The far majority of that pie is going to be divided up into training and diet. And if, if, if your diet and your training are dialed in, then you have to determine, you have to really be really realistic and honest about, about that. Then you have to determine, what am I doing? What sport am I, what do I want to do? Do I want to get huge and ripped? Do I want to get huge and strong? Do I want to be, be, be small and fast? What, what's the goal? And then you can start determining, you know, what you want to do once you determine, number one, what your realistic expectation is for the drugs themselves, and two, what your ultimate goal is. Okay, what would you say would be for the average guy? Uh, you know, I want to gain some muscle. I've never done anabolics before. I've been working out for a while. My diet's pretty good. Uh, wh- where would where where do they usually start? What do the, what do the doses look like? How old are you? Uh, okay, somebody in their twenties or thirties, I would say. <clears throat> Late twenties? Yeah, let's do that. Let's because okay. that, that'd probably be more responsible. By the way, I do want to say I'm not recommending uh, you do this kind of stuff, but I think that this information is important because you go online and read what some people say in forums, and I guarantee people are getting information that's harming their health. So 
That's why I wanted to talk to you. Bro science at its best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of misinformation out there and I don't know where it comes from. I don't know how it gets construed. I think part of the problem is, is that gurus and coaches like to really needlessly complicate the matter so that they can look more astute and smart and, you know, have, have all the answers, but it, it's, it's a bunch of bullshit. Um, if the, it is irresponsible to to suggest or condone the use of steroids in adolescent people. I mean, men and women. So if you're in your early 20s, I, I don't think there's a there's a exact age pinpoint where you can say 22. And then after 22 is good and below 22 is bad. But it's in that neighborhood. So you have to worry about, number one, I would worry about bone epiphysis being solid so that you're not limiting, you know, growth by, by messing with your growth plates. Um, I would also want to make sure that you're in good health and, and all that. And if you have all no family history of heart stuff, no weird blood work, no, you're all the lights are green, you're of age. Okay. So you've been training, your diet's good and you want to start you know, you want to gain some muscle mass. I, I, I would, I would first get a blood, get your blood work done, find out where your hormone levels are at to spe specifically testosterone, free testosterone and total testosterone and, and your TE ratio and see what you got to see where you're, what you got to work with. If you're really low testosterone then you're definitely a candidate for, in, you know, adding testosterone. If your natural test level is pretty high and you don't want to go overboard and go crazy, you, you might want to just consider, a, a, you know, like I called before, the as, an aesthetic steroid stack it would just be a couple, one or two different steroids to, to get you a, to get your little bit, you know, advanced working out and, res, and recovery response. If you want to take it the next, the next level up, I would definitely consider, you know, testosterone as a baseline. If you're a 200, let's say you're a 200 pound guy and you want to gain, you know, a few pounds of muscle, I would start at probably a thousand milligrams a week of testosterone with three to 500 milligrams of a, of a steroid on top of that and see how it goes. Mm. And see what happens. Okay. Um, wow. That's the, 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 from, that sounds like a pretty big, uh, is that a pretty high number or is that what you would consider? Like, look, if you're going to get into it, this is where you're going to see some of the big, you know, benefits. Well, it, there's, there's, it, that's a loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're dealing with a younger person. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as you're older, and I, I don't have the the actual medical studies to support this. I'm just speaking from personal experience that the older you are, the less you need. Oh, I see. So a younger guy, probably because his, his system is used to dealing with a, a high hormone load, that you would need a higher hormone addition to surpass what your body's going to you know lose by shutting down your own testosterone production. So you have to you have to judge. If you're if you're already whatever you take whatever test your test you take you're going to lower your your or eliminate your own testosterone production so you have to subtract what your body would be producing from the total equation to determine how much you're going to add because you have to make up for that this that that test your body's not going to produce anymore so while it sounds like a lot, it really isn't because you're compensating for what your body's going to stop producing. And then the added steroid steroid on top of that. Yeah, I mean, it, you, you got to look at it this way. If you're going to do it, you might as well do it. it, it not, don't just do it and do it a little bit. It's like being a little pregnant. You, you got to, you're either, you either are or you aren't. So if you're going to, if you're going to go for it, go for it. Don't just stick your toe in the water and leave it there. I mean, you, you got, I mean, it, it, it's a big boy decision and you got to be prepared to to deal with it. And and if you're going to deal with it, then don't do it half-assed. Go for it. Mm. How long does that normally last uh, a cycle like that? Are they what, eight, 12, 16 weeks? What does it look like? You know, back in the day, guys would do, you know, eight weeks was the magic number. If you went 10 or 12 weeks, you were a renegade. And, and this was only pre-contest. So we've definitely come a long way with respect to that, you know, guys taking 5,000 milligrams a week and not going off for their entire career. And, and you know, we're, we're you've, that's a huge extreme. So I, I have found that 
your dose duration is tied to two things. One is your blood work and two is your overall physical health. So if you're taking whatever dose you're taking and you're monitoring your blood work every 10 weeks or so, and your estrogen's not getting out of whack, your prolactin's not getting out of whack, your estradiol is not out of whack, and you're pretty much do you know, your, your LDL is good, all your other markers of health are fine, your, your liver enzymes are not too far out of whack, everything, that's look, everything that looks good, then you just can, you can keep going and worry about bringing your own testosterone, your own test production back, you know, when you're ready to get off, if you want to have kids or whatever. But um, the latest, the latest vogue is to just stay on Mm. and deal with the consequences later. So with that in mind, you can, you can stay on a, a, a cycle like that for pretty much, you know, as long as you want, as long as you're monitoring your health markers and are willing to deal with the aftermath. So up to you now when you come off uh i would assume your your natural testosterone would be in the floor what are some of the ways uh that you could kick that kick start that back into gear or is it just a waiting game it, it could be both i mean i, I know I, you're right your test your natural test level is going to be in the basement when you stop um i i i've seen them you know in in double digits i mean it's really really low so um you know, you, you've got a, you've got two choices. You can wait it out, and your body will definitely respond and 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 kick your own production back. You know, in, into full gear in time. Or um, if if your blood work warrants it, I would look at using you know some form of post cycle therapy, and typically that would be a mixture of um, HCG, human cryonic gonadotropin, and um, uh, uh, clomid. Hmm. And that's probably a 30 day cycle. You're going to do HCG for 15 days. I'll I'll just give it to you. 2000 I use a day for 15 days, plus about 50 migs of Clomid a day for 30 days. And And that that should, and and that gets things moving faster. That should raise the dead. Yes. Okay. (laughs) Now, (laughs) now when you're done with all that, you do the HCG, you do the, the, the Clomid, uh, do you then, okay. So that's going to boost you Clomid by, I mean, HCG by itself will do that. And then you go off. Do you then stay that way, or does it go down again and then come back up? Well, you, you'll you'll that cycle, that course of PCT should bring you back to your natural, you know, okay. operating range, and it should just stay there unless till you till you mess with it again by doing more drugs. Okay. Now we we're talking about a guy right now. What about women? Women nowadays are using anabolics uh, way more than they ever did uh, before. What are women using? And, you know, maybe even before we say that, do you think it's a bad idea for women to even touch anabolics? I mean, I know when a, if a woman decides she wants to uh, transition to uh, a male, they put her on essentially the same stuff she would take if she were trying to improve her performance. Um, so let's start there. Should women stay clear? Um, and then the ones that do use it, what are they using? Because I would assume they're not even getting anywhere near what you would say a guy would take. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Wow. wow right. <laughs> um, well, it, 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 that is, it's a huge question. It depends. It depends on a lot of things. Number one, it depends on the girl. What does she want to do? And what is she willing to accept in order to do that? Because side effect wise, the side effects a woman is going to experience taking male hormones is radically different than the side effects a male is going to take taking male hormones. So right there is your number is your big question is what is she willing to accept? So if she's willing to accept all of it, then there's one course. If she's willing to accept only some of it, then there's another course. If she's willing to accept none of it, there's still something you can do, but not as much. What, so, so what does that look like then for someone? Let's say somebody's like, I don't want too many crazy. I don't want to get a beard and I don't want uh, an Adam's apple. Uh, you know, I want uh, some something from it. What are they typically doing? But they don't want the, all the side effects. 
Well, what does she want to do? Does she want to do CrossFit? Does she want to do bikini? Does she want to do bodybuilding? You know, does she want to be a swimmer? Uh, what does she want to do? Let's say, let's say that's a good question. I'm glad you're saying this. Yeah, this is good because I think a lot of people don't realize that there's a difference uh, when you know based on what the athlete or the person is looking for. It's not a one size fits all. But because yeah. we're speaking to a large audience, uh, I would say bikini. That's probably what more women, more mainstream fitness fanatic women would identify with, uh, you know, less so, you know, bodybuilding or, or those other sports. A rich boyfriend, plastic surgery and cocaine. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, I mean, that, that, there's 10 through 26 in, the, in, your, in your typical bikini show. Um, there's, you know, it's it just, look, bikini, that's an interesting topic, bikini, because I'm, I'm, I'm a dinosaur. I'm one of the old school guys that cringed when bikini came along. You know, I felt that the, that the, that the, at, that the athlete aspect of the sport was sort of attacked because mm -hmm. You could go to your basic pool bar and the beer tub girl could be a card carrying pro athlete, member of the IFBB, you know, and that, that, that's kind of a smack in the face to the guy who's got to, you know, almost die to get the same thing. So, you know, bikini is, is, is one of those things where the girl, if she's going to really be a hardcore balls to the wall athlete really doesn't need anything mm. in terms of performance enhancing drugs. She just needs to work hard. Um, and that's probably true for 90% of the bikini girls out there. The other 10% are probably hormonally challenged, have issues, physically challenged and whatnot, and, and really need a lot of help, you know, getting in shape. And for them, yeah, there's drugs they can use. But I'm of the belief that Anything beyond clenbuterol and 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 maybe some GH, um, that that's about the extent that I'm going to look at a, a, a bikini girl doing. Mm. Let's talk about that. So clenbuterol, um, from my knowledge, was an asthma drug. Uh, it was a drug originally given to people to open up their their you know bronchial passageways, and then we were giving it apparently to cattle to to bulk them up a little bit, and that's when athletes got their hands on it. What does, what is, is, am I right? Is that what it is? And, and what does it do? Is it a steroid? No, it's not a steroid. Clenbuterol is a bronchial dilator. Uh, basically the effect that you're, you're getting from it is tremor. So if you take clen, you just find that your hands are shaken and that tremor is systemic. And that tremor basically burns more calories than if you weren't tremoring. So by virtue of the extra calorie burning, you're getting added, you know, a lipolytic effect. So the, the, the benefit to clenbuterol is fat burning. Um, the, 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 the proposed anabolic effect is absolutely minimal, um, not worth taking for the anabolic effect. Uh, it, it's really typically used, you know, for getting lean. Mm. What about albuterol? Albuterol is a, a drug that I was prescribed as a kid. Now I took it through inhaler, but I know you could probably take it through tablet as well. It sounds like Kim clenbuterol. Is it this, is it similar? Similar. Yeah. Okay. In, in terms of bronchial dilation, I don't think the tremor is as pronounced in, in albuterol, but it's, the, it's the same, same idea. You are, it's, it's a drug designed to open your airways so you can breathe. Huh. That's weird. I never heard anybody explain it that way. So basically you're taking a drug that's making you shake a little bit, and then that extra shaking is making you burn extra calories. You're taking it for its side effect. Wow. That's what Duchesne discovered. He read about the drug. This drug's side effect was weight loss due to tremor, and this was great for bodybuilding. So, you know, that's one, that's one of the hundreds of things you're doing today that this guy discovered that you – no idea he did. Okay. You mentioned growth hormone, uh, another hormone that athletes have been using for a little while. Uh, how, how does growth hormone work in, in comparison to anabolic steroids for performance? Are they in the same category or totally different? Well, growth hormone is not a sex hormone, so it completely falls out of the anabolic hormone list that people are used to. It's not a steroid. Um, it, 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 growth hormone is basically a, 
to put it in the simplest language possible, is basically a hormone that stimulates other things to happen. Tissue repair, growth, and growth, um, burning body fat. There's a host of effects, collagen uh, enhancement. Um, there, there's a lot of benefits to, to growth hormone just in the sense that it's a hormone your body uses for growth and repair throughout the course of your life, especially when you're little, um, and gradually ebbs as you get older. To replace that or add more to it brings back sort of the, the youth generating effects, which it's predominantly used for. There is a secondary anabolic, I wouldn't call it anabolic effect. I call it more like a muscle preserving effect that you can you can experience muscle preservation under restricted calories you won't lose as much muscle on growth hormone as you would without it on a, on a significantly calorie restricted diet and then there's the fat burning component of it which makes it very attractive on top of all of that there's almost no side effects to it there's definitely no masculinizing side effects to it so it's preferred by women for that uh you add fat burning and no male side effects, women are lining up for it. So there's, there's definitely that aspect of it. Um, there, is side, there are side effects, from, don't get me wrong, they're just not negative, socially um, repugnant side effects like you get with you know, male drugs. So uh, it, it's, it's definitely a, 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 a drug utilized by women more for that respect. Also, and there's also other steroids that are extremely mild that, uh, that women will use like, you know, Anivar and pro, uh, Primabol and you know, to, to some degree Winstrol. I don't, I don't like Winstrol in women, but uh, Primabol is my favorite to use in women uh, because it's just almost no side effects and you get a lot of good effect from it. Interesting. Um, so growth hormone, fee what does it feel like then? Because, you know, I kind of get an idea now what it, what, it, what it feels like to be on steroids. What does it feel like to be on growth hormone? Is it more subtle? That's what I've read. Much more subtle, much, much more subtle. Um, it, 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 and, that, and that, of course, is dose dependent. Many, uh, many of, this, of, the, uh, of, the, of the published data are, um, are of a dosage between two and three I use a day for you know, an average adult, which is very low compared to athletes who are taking four, five, six I use a day. So the feel you're going to get at a higher level is different than the feel you're going to get at a lower level. The lower level feel is almost not perceptible. It is over time perceptible. I had a great case of a, of a woman I worked with. She was a neighbor of mine in Mexico. Um, she lived in Arizona and our paths wouldn't cross as often because of our travel schedules. And I had, she had asked me about growth hormone. I suggested that she use it, how much she used. She was in her 50, early 50s. I hadn't seen her in about six months until our paths crossed again. And when I did, it was like, did you have a facelift? Did you have a plastic surgery? Well, what did you do? And she goes, I've only been doing what you told me to do. And, and the difference was absolutely staggering what it, what it did for this woman in terms of her, you know, the youth elements of her face, the collagen replacement, the health of her hair, the, the diminution of wrinkles, the, the clarity of her eyes. She was a whole different person, you know, by virtue of, you know, a, a, a two I use a day of Monday through Friday of HGH. Wow, that's interesting. All right, so these days, uh, drugs have gotten, or I should say, performance enhancing drugs have gotten more interesting. Um, I, you know, I was talking about this on my podcast on, on Mind Pump uh, the other day, where um, I was doing some research for our interview on SARMs, selective androgen receptor uh, modulators, and go back on Facebook and I'm getting all these ads on Facebook for SARMs, like mainstream ads. You can buy them on the internet, get a mail to. So first off, what are SARMs? And second, um, why am I able to buy them if I want on the internet? And then third, what do they do? Selective androgen modulator, receptor, mod receptor modulator. It's, it's <clears throat> basically... <clears throat> Excuse me. It's it's a it's a drug. I guess in the simplest terms, it's a drug that specifically targets something that you want to do. And I, I guess the most common one that people are familiar with is Novadex. Novadex is a SARM. Novadex specifically looks for estrogen and blunts it. So that's that's what you're that that's the objective. So. 
selective selective receptor modulators are 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 kind of like this new breed of drug that are that are that are site specific androgen uh, receptor specific so you have a receptor site for this drug you get this drug attaching itself to it and no other hmm. so you have no other infiltration no other side effects no other nothing other than the specific receptor you're trying to modulate okay and and so that's what the the problem with them is they are experimental drugs and because they're experimental drugs, and this falls under the exact same category as pro, uh, pro hormones and peptides, is that there's no human use for them. There's no approved human use for them. They're research chemicals. So when you go buy them online, unless your address is a laboratory somewhere, you're breaking the law. So it, it, it's, they're, they're, they're not as legal as people think they are and and as as the law as the steroid law is written it's anything with the steroid like effect so if you're promoting this drug as steroid like or eliciting steroid like effects you're breaking the law so they, they sound like a good thing on the surface because they can people think they're you're not going to go to prison using them but um, that's not entirely true. Okay, so Novadex is a, a CERM, right? Uh, estrogen modulator. Yeah, SARMs CERM. go to the androgen. Um, so SARMs essentially, the way they advertise them is like, you know, you get, you know, you build muscle, right? Because the androgen receptor is what testosterone or steroids attach to. You build right. muscle, get stronger, burn body fat, but you don't get the same side effects you would get from steroids. What's your experience with SARMs? Is, is that true or is it all just, you know, hype? I, I look at all of the alternative preparations with a jaundiced eye because I ask predominantly first, why? On this side, you have drugs that we know steroids work. They work great. Why do you want a, 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 an alternative? Do you want the alternative because it's better? Well, that's not true because they're not better. Or do you want the alternative because so you can say you're a natural athlete or you don't use steroids, you use this other thing that's not a steroid. So you have a moral clarity in what you're doing so that you don't think you're doing anything bad. So I, I, I always defer to the steroid because typically, we know more about them. The effect is we, expectable. We know what we're going to get from using them within a range. And we, we know what the downside is. We don't really know enough about SARMs. We don't know enough about uh, peptides and prohormones to make any of those assertions. So right off the bat, the, 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 the lack of study we have regarding them turns me off to them. Secondarily, I haven't heard of any of them being as good or better than the real hormone. So they're, they're not something I'm holding too much. And they're, not, to, not to mention the number of people who are failing drug tests long after they stop using these things, um, they're getting popped on drug tests. So on every way I look at it, I, I stay away from them. Yeah. You're, uh, I mean, it to what you were saying, testosterone, we've been studying forever. It's a relatively non-toxic hormone. I mean, I could inject a massive amount and I'm not going to die of toxicity. We don't know uh, much about these SARMs and I'm sure they're, they're, they're probably toxic at much lower doses than uh, testosterone. You mentioned drug tests. Okay. This is where uh, I have a lot of questions because athletes at high levels are using anabolic steroids and hormones and, you know, banned substances they're not supposed to use. These organizations test them and look at Lance Armstrong. He won so many races, did so well, passed every drug test, never failed a drug test. The only reason why we know he used performance enhancing drugs is because his friends ratted him out afterwards. How the hell are, uh, are, are athletes passing drug tests? <laughs> That's the ten thousand dollar a month question. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to give up any secrets, John. <laughs> you know, it, back in the day, I, I probably would have, but right now, um, 
I would say the majority of my business is athletes who are at the pro football level, Olympic track and field level, Olympic cycling level, and um, CrossFit, elite CrossFit level, all of which are drug tested, um, significantly drug tested. And the drug testing has gotten more and more and more challenging as time has gone on and they've been availed to what the loopholes are. So now that beating drug tests is relatively or exponentially much more difficult than it used to be, and the tools we have to work with are fewer and harder to come by uh, and expensive to to arrange, that no, I, I, I'm not letting those secrets out. Oh. <laughs> significant, significant contributions to my bank account. <laughs> okay, John. Well, okay. How about this? Uh, uh, let's go back to when drug tests were predictable. We knew we were going to get tested at this time. Uh, they're testing me for anabolics and whatever. How did athletes beat them back then? Were they just using anabolics that were like testosterone, which is identical to your own testosterone, then dropping the dose before the test? What were they doing in those days? All right, I'll, I'll let I'll let some of the cats out of the bag. Just, I just I, that's such a, ooh, it's a, it, it, that's a that's a pot of stew right there. What, what, what you gotta first of all, you gotta know a, a lot about yourself before you can determine where and where you where and what you have to do, where you have to go, and what you have to do to beat a drug test. Okay, so. Right off the bat, the drug test is cleaved into two pieces. One is going to be testosterone, and the rest of it's going to be everything else because testosterone cannot exist in a typical metabolite drug test because we'll all fail it because we're men and we have testosterone. So the drug tests only determine yes or no. It's, it's either the drug is there or the drug is not there. So we're all going to fail the, the testosterone drug test. So what they do is they test for a ratio of epitestosterone to testosterone. And that the range is one to one to one to four, the testosterone, epitestosterone respectively. So if you take test, your test level is going to go up, your epitestosterone is going to go up commensurate to that level to maintain the ratio. And if you fail the drug test, you're failing the drug test because your TE ratio is above four to one. Now what the lab does is if you have a drug test that's over four to one, you have to get that drug test confirmed by a um, you know complicated test uh, that's going to determine whether or not the added testosterone, the excess testosterone source is animal or plant. If it's an animal source, if the source is animal, that's just your TE, TE ratio, that's from you and you're gonna pass the test. If it's from a plant source, you're gonna fail the test. However, it is up to the federation. The, the, the drug testing lab does not notify the athlete. It notifies the federation. If it says the federation, athlete 4786213 failed, you know, uh, it has a TE ratio above four to one that we recommend the, the, the atomic level test. It is then up to the federation whether they want to shell out the money to confirm that. So right there, that's pass or fail phase number one. Are you the superstar athlete that would give the blackest eye possible to your sponsors, the sport, the federation, if you fail your drug test? If so, we're sweeping that shit under the rug. So we're not going to, we're not going to bother with the secondary test. Okay. If you're some poor schmuck in the middle of the field, yeah, we're going to make an example out of you and we're going to spring for the 1500 bucks, get you to fail the test and kick you out. Did you ever notice that it wasn't Lance Armstrong that was failing the drug tests? It was it was Floyd Landis. It was the guys below. It was guys below him that were failing the drug test. It wasn't him. Okay, so they there's the sacrificial lambs and there's the and there's the preservation property. You're gonna preserve the 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 sport is gonna seek to preserve its superstars and not hurt them, unless some 
machination of issues occurs in the case of Barry Bonds, in the case of Lance Armstrong, it was usually because the guy was a monumental dick. People hated him and were trying to do everything they could to undermine him. I guarantee you if Barry Bonds was a nice guy, if uh, 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 um, Lance Lance was a nice guy, they'd still be, they'd still have their, their, their accolades. Yeah. So what you're saying is it's in these professional organizations that generate money, have viewers, do the whole thing. It's in their best interest to not uh, kick out their, their biggest draws, if you will. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. That, I, always, I, mean, I, I always thought that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you, you rare, I mean, so, I mean, it, it's, it's been called to the mat so many times that now they're starting to do it. But prior to, I think last year, you never saw the top string guys pop, getting, failing their drug tests. Now, or do we assume that they're all clean? Hell no. You know, the, the fact, and, and that's, that's what Lance Armstrong personified the most, the clearest message that you could ever derive from this whole thing is just because you fail the drug test, I mean, pass the drug test, doesn't mean you're clean. Mm. Wow, so, that's, that's pretty crazy. So back to Barry Bonds. I noticed, this is something I noticed about him. Obviously, he got a lot bigger uh, as his career went on, but so did his head. I don't mean figuratively. I mean, literally, his head exp it grew. What was that from? Was that from growth hormone, testosterone? Like, why would, why would your skull grow? Well, I, I don't know if it is, is skull per se. Um, you know, one of the side effects of testosterone or or some steroids is water retention, and sometimes you get water retention in the face, um, and it makes your head look bigger. So, yeah, that could be a possibility. Growth hormone can make your jaw grow, your your brow bow the grow. Then there are those typical agromegalia side effects that you know the giantism, you know, that pe people talk about or are, are the side of it, but your whole head does not grow. No. Okay. You know, John, I'm <laughs> thinking back to, you know, I used to run a gym down in, uh, in Southern California and I, in, in the gym I was running, it was close to the border between, uh, Mexico and the U S. And so I would have trainers and stuff. They'd go down all the time, pick up, you know, anabolics, come back or whatever. And I remember there was such a huge difference between, there was one guy, uh, and he was on way more anabolics than almost anybody else that worked for me, and he looked like a regular dude in the gym. He worked out hard. He had a good diet. He, and then there was another guy. I remember this. was another guy who, who took the lowest dose and looked like he exploded. Is there a genetic component to how you respond to these drugs as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. There, there, and again, a, another pot of stew. There's all kinds of things that are, are involved with that. There's everything from myostatin negativity to receptor propensity. So it depends on the person. Yeah, but yeah, it, it is definitely, a, a, there are a certain amalgam of physical characteristics that line up in such a way that it doesn't matter what drug you're going to do. You're just you're just not going to get the benefit out of it. But and then there's other guys, like you just said, that you can just breathe. If you're taking tests and breathe on them, they grow. So, you know, it, it, it does. It does depend on your on your makeup. Now, is there are there permanent effects uh, or results from it? So let's say you do steroids and you know, growth hormone, whatever, and you do these for – on and off for a year, two years, three years, four years, and then you decide, hey, look, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to go off. You do the proper post-cycle therapy, hormones come back to normal. Do you lose all those gains or do you keep a certain percentage of them? It, 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 comes, down, it comes down to what you do to preserve it. Um, I think one thing people have to understand is that your arms grow – not because you want them to, and they look cool. Your arms grow as any other muscle in your body is going to grow. It's a it is an, is a direct response to the, the body survival mechanism. It, it's a it's a it's a stress response. The reason muscle grows is because you've subjected it to a stress that it can't handle. So if you can convince your body by virtue of your workout intensity that I need this muscle and you feed it, you got the right nutrients on board, it's going to keep it. You convince your body that I don't need this much. I only need 
20% of this, then, and if you don't feed your body, you will lose it. So it, it just depends on what you put your body through. Recovery and, and nutrition are the key elements to keeping muscle, not drugs. Okay. So along those lines, that leads me to the next question um, because uh, these days we're starting to see a lot of controversy or should I say discussion around uh, transgender athletes entering into sports. And the argument for, because the argument against is saying, hey, look, it's, un it's not fair. You're a biological man. You transition to a woman. Uh, it's not fair. It's not fair competition for you to compete against biological women. The argument uh, pro is if they transitioned and they've been and we've if they've brought their testosterone levels down and they're on hormone blockers and they've been that way now for a year, they've erased whatever advantage uh, that they have. So now you've worked male, you know, men, women, you've done, you know, they're, they're, they're anabolic hormone cycles. You've been in that whole world. You know how hormones affect the body, both temporarily and permanently. Um, so I think you're one of the best people to ask this question. Is this uh, a fair playing field? Is it a level playing field or is this okay once they bring the hormone levels down and are their new gender for, you know, however, however long the organization says they're supposed to be? It's a bunch of horse shit. And, and, and I'm probably going to take a lot of flack from, be, from this for being insensitive and, and xenophobic or homophobic or whatever you want to call me. But there's only two genders. There is male and there is female. And what separates those two is not psychological. It is biological. It's physical and it happens in the womb. And it happens in the womb to the degree that it is undeniable. So the fact of the matter is, as little as baby zygotes, we all start off as female. There is at some point during the gestation, a hormone cascade that effectively will turn that zygote male or keep it female. If there's any contradiction in that, it's going to revert back to female. So Th that, that's what the body does. Now, if you think that you're a male trapped in that female body, that's not biological. That is psychological. And you can have all kinds of issues with that and seek help, professional help and deal with it however you want, but you are not going to use it as a crutch to get into a sport that is, belongs to the opposite sex. And what happened, what I, the reason I emphasize opposite is because men and women are opposite. So just because you stop taking testosterone doesn't undo the testosterone, the, uh, what the testosterone did since you were the little baby zygote and transitioned from female to male in the womb. So fast forward now, all that to today, you're still bigger, stronger, and more physically superior than a, a zygote who stayed female and is now a female. So y y y the drugs have already been done. You're not going to undo mother nature. You're not going to undo what made you female in the womb. I mean, what made you male in the womb? That's not going to ever happen. So if you're a male and you take all the female hormones you want, it doesn't undo the male structures that you were born with and you will be forever superior physically to your count female counterpart. Okay. So it's, it's ridiculous. Now, now, here, to, now, to be fair, to play the opposite side, uh, if I got my testosterone levels down to what a woman's testosterone levels are, if I took hormone blockers, if I transitioned... I would definitely notice a drop in strength and performance. But what you're saying is there's still a permanent amount that is going to be there no matter what. Okay. Correct. Okay. So unfair. You think it's not fair and uh, this, they, this, this shouldn't be even a, a, an argument is what you're saying. Unfair. It's going to destroy women's sports completely. Women's sports are going to be dominated by also ran males who happen to identify with being female at the moment. And it's, it's, it's absolutely ludicrous. And I don't know, I don't even understand how an actual serious athlete can stomach the fact that they sucked so bad as a male that they had to be, they had to compete as a girl in order to win. I, I don't even know how you sleep with yourself at night knowing that you're that bad that you had to actually compete against girls to get the accolades mm -hmm. you think 
you deserve. Well, here, let me ask you this then, okay? Because again, playing the opposite side, uh, you know, I, they, I would say, I don't think people are, are doing things to their body that could cause permanent serious harm just to win competitions. Now, you're, you've worked with lots of high-level athletes. Uh, is that a true statement or do you athletes do crazy things to themselves all the time? To try to no, win. No, 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 no. You, first of all, first of all, there are no, there are no men who are taking female hormones so that they can. Th th I'm sorry, the opposite. There are no women taking male hormones so that they can compete in men's sports. If there are, it's extremely rare. The the predominant action that's happening here is shitty male athletes. Got masquerading as women, even if they take female hormones to try to compete against women, you're never ever going to undo the, the 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 physical advantage that a male has over a female, and you're never going to create an advantage in a female over a male by taking by doing the opposite. So it's completely one sided. There's no stampede of women to try to compete in men's sports. The stampede is men trying to compete in women's sports. Yeah, well, okay, so uh, a lot of what you're saying, I would say uh, I agree with just being in the fitness space. I've known very high-level competitive women who take high doses of anabolic steroids, uh, are definitely very strong, can perform at incredible levels, stronger than the average male, but they don't come close to, uh, you know, even what natural top level male athletes can come to. So I've never seen, for example, a, a, a woman uh, come anywhere close to what the top men, even in the same weight class, uh, could come to, no matter what drugs uh, she takes. So, um, you know, in that case, I, I, could, I could definitely see what you're talking about. So do you think this is going to keep going in that direction? Or do you think at some point uh, people are going to say, okay, that's enough. This is what do you think is going to take before people say or, or agree with you in mass where they say, okay, this is just not fair. The snowflakes have to stop whining. You know, this idea that everybody can win, that everybody participates to get a trophy, that if you can't compete and win as a man, then do it as a woman. I, all of this idiocy has to change. You, you, there, there is the object of sport is to determine who's the best at what they do not to determine how many people can play and have fun. That's the problem. Sports are serious business as evinced by the multi-million dollar contracts at stake at the upper levels. So, you know, if, if, you, wanna, if you wanna look at sports seriously, you have to look at it seriously. And to, 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 to come away with the idea that um, to, to, to some degree that it's, that it's at all serious that a woman, that a man wants to compete as a woman, then then the, the ideology is flawed. Once you got you got to fix the, ideo the ideology first. Once you fix that, then the rest falls into place. But I, I, th there's a tremendous movement right now in America to really screw things up, uh, and it, and it's 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 attacking it's attacking masculinity it's attacking cultural norms it's attacking the the base ideologies that that are very basic like which bathroom do you use i mean the, the and, and these things are all being confounded by lunatics so you have to fix that first hmm. all right well i'm going to change gears with you a, a little bit um uh it seems like laws are loosening up on lots of controlled substances i know marijuana uh, legalized in many states, uh, medically or even recreationally. I see in some states now, uh, psychedelics are starting to become decriminalized. It looks like we're moving in that direction. Do you think hormones like testosterone will start to become less uh, less regulated or not not scheduled like they currently are? Maybe along the lines of like female hormones and how how easy it is to get, for example, estrogen or progesterone versus testosterone. Do you see it moving in that direction? The, the laws are kind of like already a, a little bit loosened as, as far as I'm concerned, or maybe not actually the laws themselves, but the, the, the chasing of them, the pursuing of justice with respect to those laws. Um, you know, it, the, the, the big steroid busts, the news of them are few and far between. 
The, um, the underground in America is extremely saturated. Uh, the raw materials from China, Pakistan, India are coming in and people are manufacturing their own. So there's, there's a tremendous availability of steroids on the black market. As far as the legitimate market goes, I would say that it's easier today to find a doctor willing to prescribe testosterone replacement than it was a few years ago. It's easier for, for patients to seek medical advice and get not only their, their hormone levels checked, but also talk to doctors and have conversations about the use of growth hormone and testosterone for anti-aging, for, for um, you know, recuperative effects, uh, adjunct treatments, off-label treatments to other certain diseases and whatnot. So they're, they're being looked at. There's less media hysteria now. You're not back in the '90s and the early 2000s. You had, you know, you had these crazy people talking about, you know, kids committing suicide and the dangers of steroids and every single solitary a celebrity that had some kind of wild fit was, you know, diagnosed with roid rage in the media and all of that stuff is gone. Um, they're, they're focused on other things now. And, the, and e even the DEA isn't looking at, at steroids like they used to. So I think from the law enforcement end of it, it's not as, it's not perceived as seriously as it once was on the, on the medical community level. I think it's being looked at less nefariously and there are more and more and more doctors who are willing to, you know, prescribe and monitor and manage uh, hormone do hormone cycles. Yeah, I, I, and I, part of it I'm assuming has to do with the fact that men's testosterone levels have been declining for the last, you know, I don't know, five decades, and so TRT is going to be. I mean, it's just growing because men are not having testosterone like they used to, and a lot of theories as to why some some theories are have to do with the chemicals we're exposed to, xenoestrogens. Others are saying. It's because we're not uh, active like we used to. But nonetheless, it's becoming, in my experience, more medically um, acceptable, more mainstream, if you will. Um, you know, one thing I love about you, John, is that, it, it, and this is why I used to love reading your stuff, is you don't hold anything back. You're very, very straightforward. You know where you stand on everything. You don't, you, t you just answer very honestly. I know you're in the new media space. You've been now for a little while, right? You started a podcast. How's that going? How's... How is it compared to when you were doing magazines and stuff? It's, is it a totally different world or the same, uh, is it the same, just different technology? Oh, it's, I, I think it's a completely different world. Um, I, I, and I'm not, and admittedly, I am not completely adapted to it, you know? Um, yeah, I do a podcast that I, I, I thought would be really popular, um, you know, with Rich Gaspari, who is a really popular guy in, in the bodybuilding world. And, you know, we've done 35 shows, I think, so far. Nothing on your level. But I, I don't know if I'm doing as good as I should be. We're getting probably between 1,000 and 1,500 downloads a show between the platforms. I, I don't know if that's any good or not. I was anticipating we'd be doing way better than that by now. Um, I think it's a matter of – I think what I find confounding today that I'm not used to is – is the, the not only the social media end of it, as, as you well know, I am not big on social media. I probably should be. You say, I remember you telling it, saying it took a, 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 quite an effort to find me originally. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was nuts because I'm everywhere. But um, yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that's part of my problem is I really don't know how to get the eyeballs generated to come look at my stuff. But we've, I, I think, you know, the people who do listen to our podcast are really happy with it. They think it's great. We've had great guests. We've had, I think, four or five Mr. Olympias on already, plus, you know, a bunch of who's who in the industry. And um, I think it's time to have some of those guests back on. And and since we've gone to video now, we, we were, we were just only audio. Now we're, I think, I don't know, 10 or 12 shows into audio and video. So, I'm, I'm hoping it'll grow. Maybe people listening to this will want to slide over to Dragon Slayer Media and check out Fitness, Fame, and Fortune. You know, you might want to do that. Yeah, well, I'll make sure I, I, I point to it in the intro. And again, I mean, just to my audience, if you want, uh, like, you want the no-holds-barred, nitty-gritty about everything, uh, you know, that has to do with fitness, um, you're the guy. I, I really don't trust 
anybody else um, as much as I do you. I know how long you've been around. I've read, like I said, I've read all your stuff. You were talking about the stuff way before, you know, anybody else. And it's funny because uh, what I know about all this, all these things, is a lot of it comes from you and Dan, Dan Duchesne, Duchesne, which you had earlier mentioned. It's funny because I'll I'll, re- I'll read stuff now, and people will talk like they. Like, oh, this is groundbreaking. We just, you know, this is what, you know, whatever. I'm like, I mean, I read, I read that back in 1995 <laughs> or whatever, you know, back in the day. Yeah, I find it interesting that people, you know, especially younger guys today who are getting into bodybuilding know so little about the history of bodybuilding and, and you know, who's responsible for what they're actually doing and why. I think the whole concept of why is, is really not addressed. Like, why are you doing what you're doing? And if you ask 10 people in the gym, they have no clue. They may think they do, but they really don't. Mm. Well, John, it's been a pleasure, man. It's always a blast uh, talking to you. I, I really appreciate you. I appreciate you and I love doing your show. And if you ever need me again, I'm never hesitate to ask. I'm always happy to do it. Beautiful. And, uh, and I'll, I'll be happy to come on your show too. So anytime. I, yeah. I want, if, can you do it tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll have my assistant reach out. Serious. We'll, we'll get it. We'll get it. I, I, want, I definitely want to have you. You're absolutely one of the guests I want to have back on. And, 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 you know, cause we sort of did our first show with you guys and sort of you interviewed us mm-hmm. and, and, um, <laughs> I would like to flip the tables on you. All right. Perfect. All right. Thanks again, John. I appreciate it. Anytime. Thank right. you. Thank you. Oh man. So, uh, that was a fiery interview with John. That was a fun one to listen to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so I have a question. Actually, I have a question for you, Adam, because, um, I mean, I have some knowledge, you know, just because I read a lot about anabolics and how much people use and this kind of stuff. One thing that John said that, uh, I was surprising. I wouldn't have guessed that he would have said this is when I asked him a starting cycle dose for a guy, 200 pounds, late 20s, early 30s, he said a gram of testosterone plus like 300 or 400 milligrams of other steroids. That sounds like a lot to me. And you were in the pro world. Is that like, what's your opinion on that? That that blew me away. Um, I found that very interesting. And it actually helped me connect the dots on some things that I've experienced personally. So uh, I've talked about that I was I was one of those young kids in his early 20s that you know experimented with steroids early on. And I took a really big cycle, you know, upwards of a gram or so when we when I first uh, first did it, the very first one. And I told you that I didn't get the greatest results, and I didn't get the greatest results because of what he said about the pie chart. Mm. You know, the other eighty percent of my my pie chart wasn't wasn't in line. You know, sure, I I took the protein shakes and and ate the bars, and I was lifting weight, training hard, but my understanding of like programming and progressive overload. Uh, my my true understanding of nutrition and, and the importance of consistency with it uh, just wasn't there yet, and so my results were were really terrible. Now I f- I felt strong and I felt different, like I definitely could feel the obviously the anabolics taking that much, but didn't get the results I ever wanted. And later on in my in in, in my lifting career, you know, fast forward to competing, I was on really low doses, but I was in my 30s, so it makes sense to me now why I felt like so good on such a low dose because I had probably already, well, I know I did because I did blood work in my late 20s and I already had testosterone in the floor from the experimenting that I was doing in my early 20s. And so just the right amount combined with, you know, my knowledge of programming and diet in my 30s really allowed me to, you know, scale to, you know, becoming an IFBB pro and so that now it makes a lot of sense to me where before it, I was like, man, this is crazy that my body is just responding. And I, I just attributed it all to, oh, it must be because I, I was that off on diet and exercise. But now it makes sense to me that maybe I had a much better testosterone levels than before. And then even though I was on a much higher dose, it, it, comparatively to where I was uh, you know, competing-wise, uh, maybe the way my body responded was similar. You well, know? so so a study had just has just come out that talked about um, the di- they, they explored the differences in how people's bodies respond to weight training, and then they were testing testosterone levels. And what they found was the testosterone levels in the in the guys that did well versus the guys that didn't do well didn't make that big of a difference. What made the big difference was the androgen receptor density. 
Right. So like this guy over here, his testosterone is 650, and then he's but he's responding way better to the workouts than this guy whose testosterone is 800. But the difference is this guy's got way more receptors uh, than the other guy. Well, this is why I was so glad that you brought up the genetic yeah. component yeah. because that was my experience too. I've met um, I've met plenty of guys that have done uh, much bigger doses than me that saw like no results. I remember yeah. I, I I helped out some. I coached some guys that uh, they came to me and the first thing that I would ask them is like you know what are what are you taking and they would they would list off these cycles that I was just like holy shit and then I and you know no offense to the guy but he he did not look like I mean he barely looked like he was a, a, a lifter much less an experienced competitor who was on that big of a cycle and so it explains a lot to me what 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 a major factor that is. Yeah, I think it's good for for especially young men to to hear that because it dispels that myth that all of a sudden you're taking this, you know, you're taking anabolic steroids and then it's going to produce this sort of superhero body uh, as a result of that. You know, maybe some you know whatever they're doing workout wise, just adding that into the mix is going to like produce this like superhero version of them. Yeah, and also here's another thing: studies also consistently show that as men age, okay, if they're healthy, testosterone levels will decline a little bit. But guess what also changes as they get older? Their androgen receptors get denser. They get more as they get older. Mm. So this, and remember that he made the comment that as the older a guy gets, the less he needs to get the same results. Mm. Probably due to the fact that he's got more androgen receptors or more better density as he gets older versus when he was younger. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was very interesting when he said now, that because I thought it, about those studies. Does that align with like muscle maturity and muscle memory uh, too? Probably. Yeah, probably. I was going to say, because you got you to factor that in. I don't know if that's all part of the same category yeah. or not, but you take somebody who's been lifting for, I mean, I know this too. I, I mean, this is uh, very apparent to me. After I had done cycles, um, even when I came off and I had the, some of the lowest testosterone levels in my life in my 30s, um, I still was bigger and had more muscle than I was in my you know early twenties, taking tons of testosterone. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now, uh, of course, the the elephant in the room is when he went off on the the, the debate on transgender athletes. Now, now he's John is just if if you don't know John, he's very just he'll just he'll just speak what he feels. He definitely um, gave us uh, his opinion. He does, and I, I tell you what, the part that I agree with. Uh, wholeheartedly is that there is a permanent advantage. And I mean, look, I, and anybody who's in fitness, who's worked with people or worked in gyms for a long time, there's a permanent, there really is a permanent advantage. I mm -hmm. can, I, I tell you what. Yeah, but the part that I, I disagree with is that I don't, I think we, we were discussing moment or you were discussing momentarily there a very, very small percentage currently. Mm -hmm. Now that could change, but a very small percentage of people, I don't think most people that you know deal with this psychological issue of feeling like they are in the the opposite sex's body go out and decide I'm going to go through this crazy transformation, hormonal surgeries, all this stuff, just so I can go win a trophy. Sure, yeah. I don't. I don't think that's I, not only. I, I don't. I think only, that's such not, a small. It's not as yeah. It's not as prevalent as the news and media would you know like show that like we think it's happening everywhere just because it's a popular exactly. topic. Right. Um, but I do. I mean, it's it's it, it, it it's a bit harsh, you know, in the way that he presented it. But also, it's things to consider in terms of like our biological differences, and to just uh, sort of glaze over that to to try and make sure everybody feels good about it. I think it needs to be considered uh, when sports is just about metrics and it's about uh, you, you know actual performance. And 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 there was a, a reason why they differentiated that between the two sexes initially, and we're trying to stray away from that. So it's something to consider when bringing it into the discussion. No, I, I agree. <clears throat> I agree with your point. <clears throat> and I, I remember when we had uh, the two transgenders on and we had the debate. Mm -hmm. And that was the point that I made was that because they remember when they did that uh, that study or that survey on all the Olympic athletes mm -hmm. on if if they could be guaranteed a gold medal, but, but then die in but, five years, but die yes. in five years at like, a, I think a it's a common mentality. Yeah, Most a, of them. Yeah. A great percentage, greater than 50% of them said that, yes, I would, I would accept dying in five years just to have a gold. Yeah. And most people in the Olympics are in two, their twenties. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're telling me that if, if that mentality is in, in that sport to get a gold medal, that it's not eventually going to attract some people that will go, wait a second, like here's my way to get it. And so I do think that even if it's a small minority today, I mm -hmm. think it 
could grow into something. Yeah, I think you know, you I agree. I think now it's pro- what's happening now is people who are transgender going through the process and then competing. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's people saying Agreed. I want to win. I can't win in this category, so now I'm going to transition. So I, I think we're, I think we're seeing the unintended consequences. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, I think that the idea of obviously allowing someone to change their sex, they're an adult, they should be allowed to do that if they want to do that. No one thought this far along that Oh, what happens when they start competing? It was more, it wasn't about that, right? What, what? It, it, it's getting to a point where yeah, there needs to be more further discussion around it. Just in the terms of like you know fair play, and I, and I really do feel there needs to be a lot more female voices that speak up in terms of like how oh, they there perceive will be. it. Oh, there will be. Oh, there yeah. is. That's where that's where it'll come, right? Yeah, so, it's because they're yeah. losing. There's there's a lot of girls losing scholarships and opportunities. Uh, right. It's, t- it's Title Nine, right? Is that what it is? I think so. Yeah. 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 So I mean, movement. you'll see, when that when that starts getting affected, right? Yeah. When you start seeing, you know, high school athletes, female high school athletes losing scholarships. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, and it won't be after one or two. It's when you'll start to see that happen yeah. more. That's when you'll, you, it'll yeah. happen. And I was definitely curious when, uh, when you brought up uh, all the different testing for uh, professional sports and like he started to kind of like uh, be a little bit reserved in terms of the techniques of how to like kind of cheat the <laughs> system and this. And I was like, I was like, well, that's something anticipating some well, real That's something the main, main source of his income, right? Dude, that's, I know. What, that's what he does. You know? but, so but, it makes sense that he doesn't want to give away his secrets because otherwise his value goes down. Right? Oh, of course. I just I was so curious because uh, I did watch that documentary Icarus, and they did kind of go through a lot of the ways that they were able to go around some of the tests and what the methods that they used in Russia, uh, and all that is public knowledge. Uh, so to to differ to see how you know any of those methods would would be uh, you know in, in our market would be well, somewhat would, different. Would be Icarus only went over blood doping though, wasn't that all they? That's the only thing they testosterone covered. They did too. All of it. They yeah. did. Yeah. yeah, I don't. I watched that documentary. I don't remember. The you know what? Though here's the deal. Okay, it, no one is going to give away how they're getting away with it now. They might give away how they got away with it before. Right. But but the testing is constantly chasing the mm-hmm. new methods. It's not the other way around. It's, it's cat and mouse. It, it's cat and mouse. And so what they did five or ten years ago, you'll you could figure out what I, they're doing now. You got to pay somebody like I John do love though that you guys yeah. you guys went that direction. Talk about because this has been a long debate for like my buddy. I mean, we've been debating this since we were like in high school. Mm-hmm. Right. Obviously, I before I was in this field, and I think I had more uh, knowledge and uh, like firsthand. Mm-hmm. Uh, I used to debate this. I used to tell my friends that you know these pro athletes, they're all on steroids. You know, yeah. I would say most of them, 80, 90 percent of. I don't care if you're a pitcher, mm-hmm. who you are, like you know, a sport that because everybody always thinks steroids and think big muscular. Mm-hmm. Right, like I just think that you're gonna get this. You're like, oh, he's not massive. Oh no, look at him. He doesn't look like yeah, exactly. You so can't they, tell. So they assume that mm-hmm. they're not. But it's like, no, at that level, millions of dollars are be, are being made. If you think every the, enhancement matters, yeah. If you don't think that a, a majority of these guys, I I find it more rare when we have friends like Brendan or my buddy uh, Frampton, who is both these guys were all natural athletes, and unfortunately they weren't huge names in the sport because they weren't willing to take. The next step, which all their peers yeah, were doing. If you're making millions of dollars based off of your physical performance, and you have doctors ready and willing to prescribe you and monitor you, mm-hmm. and you have an organization that is ready and willing to turn or shield you, to shield you, uh, that's that's the name of the game. Yeah, it's, it's part it's big of the business. It's part of the whole thing. It's like it's like being in movie. Look, Hollywood, same thing. You know, mm-hmm. you're an actor, or an actress. And you're getting ready for you know they're making you know Avengers again and, and they're gonna have Justin you know be one of the one of the guys or whatever. Naturally. Pretty sure <laughs> they would say, all right, Justin, you got uh, six months or a year to get ready for this role. Here's a doctor. They're gonna do your blood work. They're I'm, gonna. Op- I'm taking all the stuff. Yeah, they're gonna optimize all your stuff. Don't worry, we have it all covered. Here's your nutritionist. They're gonna make your meals for you. Here's your gym. You got a trainer. You just gotta do the work. Just do the work. Oh, and by the way, we're gonna pay you you know five million dollars or ten million dollars to do it. I mean. And you have doctors monitoring you, so all the potential scary stuff is taken care of. Mm-hmm. You're probably going to do it. I wonder how much of that is actually like the the movie industry pushing it or allowing, or it's just more the other thing where they just turned a blind eye, and it's more the actor who's like, "Hey, no, I'm, I'm going to have to have my yeah. shirt off 90 percent of the so time like, here. We need you, Jack. I want to look three months. I, I want to look amazing. I bet you it's it's the. It's, you think so? Yes, and I bet you. I don't think so. I think the big actors have their own system, so the big actors go in and they don't. They're like, "Oh yeah, I got it. Six months. Don't worry. They already got their doctor. They got." or whatever I got that taken care of yeah. but I bet you it's almost like you know the 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 the, ta- the person who manages the talent is like and, and they probably position it this way they probably say hey look here's a deal you're going to get in shape for this role um here's a doctor we work with 
They're going to test your hormones and they're going to optimize your hormones and your health so that you can get in the best shape possible. That's all. And it's yeah. all perfectly legal. And the doctors, look, let me put it this way. If I did your blood work, Adam, and I'm a doctor, I could literally say, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to push your testosterone to this upper limit. Your growth hormone, we could push it up to this limit within the parameter. They're not on bodybuilding doses, mm. but I guarantee they got- Well, no. Uh, I, yeah. That's I what, just find it hilarious, though. Like, immediately after all that, they get a men's health spread, like, every single time. Yeah, like, totally. Like, just, what, what, what did you do? Yeah. Like, what supplements were you on? And, like, what kind of crazy CrossFit workout did you do this whole time? <laughs> yeah, well, you got- you got like, Get the fuck out of You got here. your workouts taken care of, your nutrition taken care of, and your and your your drugs. Uh, you know, of course. Yeah. You know, you're going to see crazy stuff like that. And they're all, yeah. I mean, and actors tend to be genetically this is all facade. somewhat gifted anyway. You know, I do want to say this. I want to backtrack a little bit and say this about the, the transgender athlete debate. I, I, I just want to be very clear. Uh, I believe individuals should be able to do whatever they want to their body. And I think everybody sure. should be treated with respect and care as an individual. The question is, and this is the debate, and what I hate about this debate is it gets silenced because if you're on the opposite side – then you're silenced as uh, some kind of a bigot, which is silly. It's a stupid way to shut someone down when they're having a legitimate conversation. And the conversation is: is there a is there a un, is there an advantage, an unfair advantage, from a man transitioning to a woman? Is there a, a permanent physical advantage that they have that can't get reversed with hormones? And I will say there apps 100% there is. And I tell you, look, I tell you what, I could take my sister and I could put her on all the drugs in the world, and I could have her testosterone levels measure 10 times higher than Justin's, she ain't going to beat him in a bench press. She's not, no, no matter what, she'll never bench press 400 pounds uh, because no matter how many steroids I give her. There is no, nothing you can do that'll erase some of those permanent changes. And I do think this debate, especially yeah. in combat sports, boy, when yeah. you see MMA, it's like, oh my gosh, someone's going to get hurt. You know, if we don't, if to we don't each stop. their own. In in individuals, I'm all for uh, individuals like choosing their own destiny and, and going the direction they they want. I just, you know, like the the thing that I always like both uh, loved and, and admired about sports is it's it's it, it's devoid of of all the different cultural aspects. It's 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 there. It's the metrics. It's are you faster? Are you know? Can you lift more? Like it, it, it was the the last place where I felt like a lot of politics didn't enter. But now it's it's definitely intertwined with a lot of what we see in culture now. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, that was a good time, huh? Yeah, yeah. Great Beautiful. episode, man. All right, so check this out. Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio, so you can come find us on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. I'm working inward, first of all. Like I'm thinking of all the things that I haven't been addressing. I'm not worried about the strength training, the aesthetics. It's not that at all. And I'm already kind of thinking about when I come out of this, the things that I'll need to start to do right away. Like how will I reintroduce calories? How will I know how much should I reintroduce? Mm. I'm already thinking.